the two people so far who said they're very familiar with the topic. Uh, okay. But let's just, um, I, I don't know what to do about the poll. I'll just make that go over there. All right, and I'm gonna start my um, slides and start my presentation. Okay, all right, so uh, a little bit about me. For those of you who don't know me, I am an assistant professor at Washington State University. I'm located at the Puyallup Research and Extension Center though, instead of over on um, the east side, as they say. I have a background in um, fisheries biology and toxicology. And the research program that I am in charge of has kind of two prongs. One is to understand impacts of chemicals on aquatic animals. And mostly that involves stormwater impacts, mostly on salmon, um, but I do do some other um, types of work as well, wastewater treatment um, type chemicals and also um, pesticide uh, chemicals as well, and also aquatic animals besides salmon. And the other prong involves uh, looking at solutions to the problem of aquatic pollution, um, primarily looking at green stormwater infrastructure, but increasingly starting to look at source control as I'll talk about later in today's talk. Of course, this work does not take place in a vacuum where I am the only person involved. So I do want to put up this acknowledgement of the research partners and funders. I'm going to be showing you, you know, uh, um, you know, about 20 years of research that I've been in, involved with, if not in charge of. Um, over and over that time, we've had a lot of funding support from um, consistently EPA Region 10, which has been really wonderful, but then lots of other uh, local governments, um, municipalities, uh, support from various tribes. And a lot of the work that I'll be showing you today uh, has involved a really strong partnership with not just NOAA Fisheries and US Fish and Wildlife Service, but also with UW and uh, Ed Kalaji's group at UW, Kalaji. So the story that I'm gonna tell focuses on coho salmon, and it does take place in the Puget Sound area, but uh, it is relevant throughout their range. And this does extend from Alaska down through central, the central coast of California. And I'm showing you on this map here, the seven broad groupings or ESUs, uh, evolutionarily significant units of coho populations in the continental US. Five, are, five of those are listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and, and there they are. Um, in fact, only one of those, so they're listed, coho are listed as a species of concern in the Puget Sound region, and the only um, ESU in the lower 48 that's not listed at all is this one out on the coast of Washington, for, for interest's sake. So in the Puget Sound region of the Pacific Northwest, we've been using coho as a sentinel for impacts from stormwater runoff for quite some time. And some of the reasons for this is that they are widely distributed and they tend to be um, you know, less in the headwaters and more in lowland streams. And of course, this will increase the likelihood that they're going to be overlapping with human land development. Uh, they're also vulnerable to impacts from runoff um, because unlike some of our Pacific salmon, coho salmon spend at least a year in freshwater before they head out to the ocean. So they hatch you know, they're rearing in freshwater as little embryos, um, which is starting to take place about now. Um, and that takes several months, but then some species just head right to the ocean after they hatch, but coho salmon will stay another year in freshwater. And during this time, they'd be vulnerable to impacts from uh, runoff from urban and other land uses. Okay, this video is, uh, <laughs> Uh, heart-wrenching for those of us who love fish. This is a really beautiful um, example of a, a just returning coho salmon. It's still pretty ocean bright. It has developed just a little bit of spawning coloration so far, and it's obviously not well. So this, this mystery that we have, well, we've solved somewhat. Um, this mystery started about 20 years ago um, in terms of our awareness of the problem. Um, and at that time, a, a Seattle, a group of Seattle area researchers noticed that coho returning to spawn in, in urban impacted streams were behaving abnormally like this after it rained. And notably, this is one of the area streams that had received a lot of restoration uh, 
work over the past few years in order to um, in order to build salmon friendly habitat. And the restorationists wanted to know, you know, if you rebuild this habitat, will they come? And the answer was yes. You know, adult salmon were again using this system, whereas they hadn't been using it before. But these otherwise really healthy looking fish were dead within hours of seeing this type of behavior. So researchers got involved at that point, and uh, this was led at the time by NOAA Fisheries and the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and they began studying this issue and found that the phenomenon uh, is both widespread and recurrent year after year. And the symptomatic fish display a variety of behaviors that include surface swimming, uh, gaping at the surface, disorientation, loss of equilibrium. And then this, this leads to high rates of uh, mortality that can affect you know, almost, the all, almost the entire run, especially in smaller systems. So population modeling done by NOAA Fisheries Researchers demonstrated that even modest rates of this pre-spawning mortality would be expected to lead to local extirpations within you know, a matter of decades. And we certainly have been seeing that throughout our region for decades well before this 20 years, right? Um, and that's an important point I wanna make is that just because we noticed it 20 years ago did not mean that it started happening 20 years ago. Um, salmon come back and spawn in these freshwater streams and for those of us fortunate enough to see those um, somewhat regularly, you know, we, we expect to find dead adult salmon in these streams. And unless you open them up, you don't know for sure that they haven't spawned. So it was only once these strange behaviors were observed that we started opening up and being like, oh, we have a problem. So the mortality that was being observed, um, initially we tried to, you know, we did a, this forensics analysis, we called it to understand, you know, well, What's, why is this happening? So we found that it was, we found many things it was not explained by. It was not explained by problems with temperature, problems with dissolved oxygen. There did not appear to be a problem with pathogens or uh, chemicals that we commonly measure in water. Um, so we did find evidence that they were exposed to common chemicals like metals and hydrocarbons, but those didn't appear sufficient to explain the mortality. So instead the weight of evidence was pointing to something about the influx of stormwater runoff. So obviously this is not a forest and that's why urban stormwater runoff is a problem is that it is that the landscape cannot act like a forest when it rains. In an undeveloped landscape, most of the rainwater um, doesn't evaporate, and, but it infiltrates into the ground. And very little of that rainwater actually flows off of the landscape into surface waters. In our, in our built up landscapes, a lot of the landscape is actually impervious. So the water cannot um, soak into the soil. Um, and, it, and as a result, it ends up running off of the surface. And as it, as it does this, it picks up chemicals or even leaches them out of those impervious surfaces um, like our roofs. So that when the runoff reaches surface waters, it is polluted with a ton of chemicals. Don't take that as a mass measurement, just as an expression. Okay, I really like this video done by Laura James uh, because it allows us to visualize the pollution that's entering surface waters with stormwater, right? This is a time-lapse video showing runoff entering into Puget Sound at Alki Beach in Seattle. And you know what we're able to see here are the particulates that are carried by the runoff, right? Fine, fine particles for the most part. Um, what we're not seeing are the chemicals that are dissolved in this water. And that's really the focus of my research. So what is it about the stormwater then that's killing coho? It's not those metals and hydrocarbons. In our initial results, um, documenting mortality rates in about seven Seattle area creeks. Um, there were more uh, extensive uh, spawning surveys that were done after that then to try to understand how widespread the phenomenon was. So at the time, NOAA Fisheries and Fish and Wildlife Service, they worked with local municipalities, with tribal nations and nonprofit groups to gather information, ultimately from more than 50 basins to build this predictive map. So at the same time, they conducted an extensive land use analysis to predict the rates of mortality um, that might be happening from coho um, due to different land uses throughout the Puget Sound region. So not surprisingly, 
um, higher rates of mortality, the, the more red colors on the map, right? We're, we're coinciding with more developed basins. However, what is it about these basins? Um, the higher rates of mortality across the region then was, was, um, was most strongly associated with um, not development or imperviousness more generally, but more specifically with the density of roads and particularly with busier roads. So there we had a bit of a clue. We should be focusing on roadway runoff within the you know, complex mixture of stormwater runoff. Sorry, somebody's calling on the landline here. So about 10 years ago, we began to study roadway runoff during rain events to try to understand what was happening, you know, what might be happening to aquatic animals, including salmon when, when that runoff reaches receiving waters. So there's this convenient spot in Seattle where downspouts from an elevated road dump directly into the parking lot at NOAA Fisheries. And I was um, collaborating there as a postdoc at the time. So I started collecting this runoff Here's a close up of the downspout where I got most of my runoff and a photo of the first runoff I ever collected in 2011. Looking really delicious. Um, it was absolutely the very first flush and it was in July. So that was pretty potent stuff. All right, so after that, after some initial experiments, um, mostly focused on zebrafish and aquatic invertebrates, um, we began exposing salmon directly to this roadway runoff uh, in order to start to understand what might be happening in receiving waters. And so in each of these PVC tubes is one adult salmon, all right? So they're, they're that big. Um, and the front ends where the arrow points, that's where their heads are. And so we're aerating the water and, and, and having water flow um, into their faces so that it helps them um, stay oxygenated. And the PVC tubes are also really helpful in keeping wild animals calm. You know, these are otherwise, you know, kind of large, powerful wild animals that we're working with. So we found that by experimentally exposing adult coho salmon to roadway runoff, that we were able to um, recreate the acute changes in behavior and that pre-spawning mortality that we were seeing in urban creeks. Oh, and then here's the other guy. So control fish, you know, after a few hours, release it from the tube into this observation tank. And then um, a fish that had been in the stormwater for the same amount of time released into an observation tank showing that advanced symptoms that we associate with this pre-spawning mortality. Okay, so we have seen that coho are very acutely sensitive to, well, something in urban road runoff. Um, mortality would occur in these exposures within just a few hours. Um, and through various experiments, we've seen that this affects not just adult spawners, but also sensitive are juvenile coho and recently hatched alevin. We've done experiments with uh, embryos and they appear to be protected from the acute mortality we see in these free swimming life history stages. Uh, and instead they show sublethal impairments, um, but it looks like they become vulnerable as soon as they hatch. All right, so of course, urban creek waters, even during rain events are not 100% roadway runoff, although some of them get pretty close, but we found that very little runoff is actually needed to cause this acute mortality. Uh, runoff collected from three different storm events, and so this is what I'm showing you here, um, and each of these produced similar toxicity, um, essentially 100% mortality at 25% uh, runoff um, and significant mortality even at 5% runoff. We had to get down to, you know, 98% dilution essentially to see no mortality at all. All right, and using juveniles, we were able to track the progress of their illness finally. All right, this was hard to do in the adults. But with juveniles, we could do this. And a change in behavior that we have observed is surface swimming, so swimming up at the surface. And so in this figure, we were I'm showing you here that the, we were tracking the amount of time they were spending at the surface um, while, they were per, while they were in runoff. So x-axis is time that they're in runoff, and the y-axis is the amount of surfacing over little time snippets. All right, so. Um, so we, we did see it so that we saw this increase in surfacing behavior um, first at about 45 minutes into the exposure, all right? And then these discrete surfacing events progressed into continuous surface swimming. 
before the fish lost equilibrium and, and eventually became incapable of moving at all. Um, so although the fish were dying in this experiment around five to six hours into the exposure, an effect on behavior was evident as early as 45 minutes. Um, and importantly, we found that, that juveniles that had transitioned to this continuous surface swimming behavior were not able to recover. When we placed them in clean water, they died at the same rate um, and in the same amount of time as juveniles that just stayed in the runoff. So in addition to the concentration of runoff that they're exposed to, exposure duration is also important. Uh, in this, in this uh, data set here, I'm showing you that we had tested three dilutions of runoff from a single storm event. So 5%, 11 and 25% runoff at exposure durations from one to 24 hours, right? And so then the rest of a 24 hour period for those shorter exposures, they were in clean water. So over the 24 hour experiment, uh, no coho died after four hours or less in 5% runoff or after just one hour in the 11% runoff, um, but at least some mortality occurred in all of the other uh, exposure combinations. So an interesting result here is that the high rates of mortality observed in a full 24 hour exposure to runoff were, were actually caused by much shorter exposure durations. So looking at those results for the 25% runoff, nearly all of the mortality from um, a 24 hour exposure occurred during the first eight hours, all right, the black bars, right? And nearly all of that mortality was actually triggered by even shorter durations, all right? They, they died in after they were transferred to clean water, but it was the four hour duration that led to that uh, mortality, ensured that mortality. Okay, um, let's see. So instead, so, that, so instead of dying in the runoff, um, these shorter exposures culminated in sickness and then death after they were you know, placed in clean water. So this means that a stormwater pulse does not need to be very long in order to trigger a mortality event. All right, so what's happening to these fish as they get sick? Uh, we found that the blood of sick coho shows evidence of osmoregulatory imbalance, such as low sodium and, and chloride, you know, low, low plasma ions, um, and that it's hemoconcentrated. So the blood can be twice as thick as in unaffected fish. Um, and this is, this is pretty high because even in fish that are, you know, exercised to death, which is a whole area of fish physiology research, um, their hematic hematocrit concentrate or hematocrit values don't reach as high of, uh, levels as we see in our sick fish. Um, we still don't know totally what the target tissue is or the molecular initiating events, but we have been making progress in that with the help of Stephanie Blair, who is my wonderful PhD student. And um, she just published a paper this, well, I guess not just anymore, but in January. Um, in the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Science, where she explored that hemoconcentration in the sick fish. And in this experiment, she focused on fish that were at the stage of losing equilibrium. Uh, she injected Evans blue dye. So this is a very high molecular weight um, dye and injected it into the fish's heart and then allowed it to circulate through their vascular system. She then rinsed out all of, all of the blood from the fish um, and then froze and, and sectioned the body. And then she was looking for fluorescence in the fish's body. So this Evans blue dye fluoresces under a certain wavelength of light. And so you can see that it's there um, without having to find something blue because <laughs> um, it'll be pretty dilute at that point. So the only, um, here we go, the only fluorescence would be where plasma and large molecules, molecules large enough like this one, um, uh, including the dye, where they had leaked from the vascular system into the surrounding tissues. All right, and so this figure is showing those results. So the, in these little boxes, you can see the hematocrit um, uh, in, in the, those runoff exposed fish, much higher than in the controls down here. And then, and then these other uh, graphs are showing you the fluorescence difference between the controls and the runoff for two different tissue types here. So, um, and then there, that, that's cartoon, well, it's not cartooned actually, it's just highlighted in um, cross sections of the fish's head region with under that fluorescent light for the brain area and then for the olfactory rosette, which is just another location um, where there's a lot of sensory tissue and she had noticed a lot of fluorescence. All right, so 
we're particularly concerned with the, the leaking that we're seeing in the brain um, because whereas blood vessels throughout most of the fish's body are leaky to various extents and ours are our own as well, but it's fish even more so, um, the blood vessels in the brain should never be permeable, right? This is what the blood brain barrier does for us is prevent um, chemicals from willy nilly escaping from our vascular system into surrounding tissues, um, the brain tissues in particular. Um, so this apparent loss of vascular integrity is, is the focus of ongoing research to understand when and how coho get sick when they're exposed to stormwater. All right, another thing we have learned is that not all species of salmon um, show this response. So uh, we've done side-by-side -side exposures with chum salmon. They often return in our region um, in, in an overlapping time frame with coho salmon. So co-exposed to just collected roadway runoff, the coho became sick within hours of exposure and they all died. Um, the chum though, neither died nor became sick <laughs> even after 24 hours in the roadway runoff. Um, and in, in, in addition to that, blood parameters that in coho were affected by the exposure prior to death um, were not at all affected in chum, even you know, at that longer exposure. Here we go. So in a subsequent experiment, uh, so that's this, you know, this contrast here, but in subsequent experiment with a couple of them actually with juveniles, we found that the next most sensitive species are um, steelhead, and Chinook, and that they showed um, various degrees of mortality in response to exposure to collected roadway runoff, whereas uh, juvenile sockeye salmon, like juvenile and adult, and adult chum, did, did not show any mortality in response to the exposure. So I also want to point out here that, um, you know, that mortality as an endpoint is, is pretty crude. Um, so in the case of this juvenile study, even if you know, even if the fish aren't dying, it doesn't mean that um, these other species aren't, aren't potentially, um, you know, impacted in a significant sublethal way that could impair their um, health and fitness. All right, what is it in stormwater that's making these salmon sick? This was not an easy question to answer. Um, urban stormwater runoff is very chemically complex. I like to use the iceberg analogy here. And we know some of the chemicals present in this mixture. Um, but very far from all of them. So some of the more recent uh, discoveries we've made, uh, Bowen Du, who was a postdoc with Ed Kologi and worked with us, um, published on the fact that there are actually thousands of unique chemicals present in urban roadway runoff. And the analysis that he was doing actually focuses, uh, focuses on organic chemicals and even then just as a subset of organic chemicals. And in there, he was able to discover, you know, the presence of thousands of these chemicals. Um, Kathy Peter, another postdoc with Ed Kologi and, and uh, now uh, a research scientist again, um, it explored the identity of some of those chemicals, but many of them, um, even if they were identifiable, uh, many weren't, um, but even the ones that were identifiable, you, we don't necessarily have a ton of toxicological information about those chemicals. And then finally, chemicals in runoff with which we are very familiar, that tip of the iceberg, do not appear sufficient to cause the observed effects. So we had previous to collecting runoff and exposing coho to that, we'd previously tried making our own stormwater runoff, right? Well, what's in there? This tip of the iceberg. Let's add, <laughs> let's add those chemicals and, and try to recreate the, the conditions. And we, and we couldn't. Um, we couldn't make the fish. We couldn't kill the coho. We couldn't... Um, make them sick, even with mixtures of metals and pHs that were, you know, tenfold higher than what we see in stormwater runoff. So we knew we were missing something. So instead of sorting through all of the chemicals in this soup, um, we began studying the sources of chemicals to roadway runoff, right? So these are coming from particles, from tire wear, particles in exhaust, particles from brake wear, and then many fluids, things we release intentionally, like, like windshield washer fluid, and then the many things that, that leak out of our vehicles. Um, and so the idea here was if we could confirm one of these sources, each one itself being a complex mixture of chemicals, then we'd have a smaller haystack to look through for that responsible chemical. All right, and so as a start to this, you know, we had the we had the clue from land, the land use analysis uh, to look for roadway runoff, right? And then we, we started working with that. Um, 
And then what are the vehicle sources of pollution in something like roadway runoff? So then with the, our collaborators at UW Tacoma, we started to exploring the chemical similarity of these vehicle sources of pollution to polluted waters that kill coho, our urban um, stream waters and also our roadway runoff. And these heat maps I'm showing you um, are showing us the relative abundance of different non-target anal analytes using high resolution mass spec. All right, and so we don't need to know what these chemicals are per se in order to compare the uh, the distribution of those unknown chemicals and their, um, their, their, their similarity across different things, right? So here we have all the vehicle sources of pollution. We have here various highway runoff um, samples and then some samples of um, urban impacted stream waters. So among ultimately 75 non-target organic chemicals that we're being um, focused on, these different water samples grouped together as being um, as being most similar to each other. So road, all the roadway runoff samples were more similar to each other than anything else. The urban impacted waters were more similar to each other than to anything else. And most of the vehicle sources also clustered together as being more similar to each other than to those water samples. But the only thing that stood out was leachate made from tire particles. All right, and it, 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 uh, it sorted itself hierarchically with the waters that kill coho, all right? But just because a lot of tire chemicals are found in, in these waters does, you know, did not guarantee that tire chemicals were the cause of the toxicity, right? So for that, we went back to our animals, let the fish tell us what's happening here and asked whether tires are an important source of the toxicity that we were seeing. So if they are, when we compared the effect of a tire leachate with, um, with our stormwater, we would expect to see mortality of, of coho. Uh, we would expect not to see mortality in chum. And we would expect that the pathophysiology, the way the sickness uh, presents itself, would look similar between the two types of waters. All right, so to test this, we, 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 we did this comparison. We had to start by generating tire powder and, uh, you know, made good use of graduate students, yay, um, with, you know, fully fitted uh, respirator masks. It's maybe not the right word, but you know what I'm talking about. You can see it right there. Um, and we used carbide grinding discs to, to wear off the tread of a number of tires and collect them together. And we made uh, equal weight mixtures of those different tires. Two, two of those tires were brand new. Seven of them were used. They were all different from each other. And yeah, so then, then we started making these, um, making the, the leachate, we would make the leachate over a 24 hour period. And for this experiment, I'm showing you here with the adults, it was at ambient temperatures, which in October, November were, were quite chilly, all right? Um, made a concentrated stock and then uh, would, would dilute that initially. I can't remember if I'm gonna show you which part of this. So I'll just, I'll just move ahead here. Yeah, so, so we did do some different concentrations just to be like, all right, are we in the right ballpark for what the effects concentrations? So to answer that first question, would we see mortality uh, when coho are exposed to um, chemicals leached from tire tread particles? Uh, the answer was yes. And we also saw that the response of adults was similar to those response that we saw in the lab with juveniles. All right, now from here, um, we took a concentration that the lowest concentration that we that we were showing was highly lethal to coho to continue uh, answering the other questions with. So to answer our second question, we just we repeated an experiment that we'd done previously with stormwater. So we co-exposed adult coho and adult chum spawners um, to the tire leachate at the concentration we showed was lethal to coho. And in coho, we saw the expected results. Um, so we repeated this experiment four times that season. So in coho, we saw what we expected, which was when they're exposed to these tire chemicals, they all died. Um, none of the controls died. And then the, um, and in chum, none of them died as well. So, so this definitely supported that, uh, that tires could be the source of the toxicity because coho show this somewhat unique sensitivity. All right, and finally, we looked at how blood parameters were affected in coho exposed to the tire leachate compared to stormwater. So in this principal component um, plot, 
there's a strong division, I hope you can see, between the white symbols, which are control waters, and the dark symbols, which are either, um, depending on shape there, either storm water or tire particles. All right. And additionally, um, there was no difference between the color, you know, the, the shape of those symbols. So there was no difference between, there we go, between stormwater and tire leachate in the way that they impacted this uh, sum of um, blood parameters. Uh, and finally, we found that the blood parameters that were driving these differences were the same. So an increased hematocrit, decreased plasma, ion content, and pHs. All right, so next step, um, which you know comes from the, the title of the talk, um, is, is how we isolated the responsible contaminant. So to do this, we paired toxicology with the high resolution mass spec. So this analytical technique, some of you know much more about this than I do, um, but it essentially detects all, we'll just say all of the organic chemicals present in a sample. And it tells you that, that different chemicals are there. You learn the mass, you learn the retention time of those chemicals, but it doesn't tell you what they are, right? So that requires more sleuthing into what this particular one might be. So we made a tire leachate uh, by recirculating water through those tire particles for 24 hours, like I just described. And then we fractionated the leachate to reduce its chemical complexity. So we did this initially by filtering through sand to remove particles, um, by chelation to remove metals, um, and then there are subsequent steps I'll show you on the, the next slide here. So each of these fractions then we exposed coho to, um, and we were using, then, using the coho as a screening tool to track the toxicity. The fraction that killed coho still contained our unknown toxicant, and through high resolution mass spec, we would take that fraction and try to identify the chemicals that were present there and then continue to fractionate to further reduce that chemical complexity. So ultimately this approach worked, which was fantastic because it didn't have to. <laughs> you know, I mentioned that, it, that high resolution mass spec does not in fact capture all chemicals and not even all organic chemicals. So there was a chance it wouldn't have worked for that, or that you know it required two chemicals that were separated through our fractionation process, um, but that's not how it turned out. So our initial tire particle leachate contained more than 2000 chemicals, and each fractionation step resulted in one, non, uh, one toxic in red here and several you know, non-toxic fractions. Uh, so, through this, we were able to se sequentially reduce complexity. You know, here's our chemical fraction in the toxic, sorry, chemical number of chemicals in the toxic fraction through each step, reducing and reducing. Until finally we got to a toxic fraction that had just four chemicals present. And it was dominated by a chemical, which, which um, when, um, when concentrated, looked like this little reddy purpley dot. Um, and this, these, this chemical mixture, just four chemicals, was dominated by a compound with this chemical formula, C18, H22, N2O2, which was present in the leachate at about 30 micrograms per liter was the estimate at that time. Okay, but what is this chemical, right? Um, it wasn't present in <laughs> any database. Um, NMR later confirmed that the structure was what I'm showing you here, but we still didn't know what it was. It did not appear to be a known tire ingredient, not found in databases, as I mentioned. Uh, but Zhen Yutian, who was the lead, uh, the lead author and the fractionation mastermind on this experiment, he made the association between this unknown C18, H22, N2O2, and the anti ozonant 6 PPD which has the same number of carbons and nitrogens, you know, and the oxygen and hydrogens can change for a variety of reasons through uh, chemical transformations, right? They're more likely to, to change. All right, so the team next purchased industrial 6-PPD and then through ozonation produced a mixture of transformation products that included our unknown, which we now call 6-PPD quinone. Um, all right, and then toxicology screening of that validated that, that this was our toxicant and that 6-PPD uh, was, um, was the parent compound. So although 6-PPD itself produced little to no acute mortality, 
um, even at very high concentrations, the ozonated 6-PPD and the purified uh, quinone, whether it was purified from the ozonation of the 6-PPD or purified from our tire leachate, those both were uh, very acutely lethal. All right, to explore the environmental relevance of the toxicant, we examined mortality curves for dilutions of roadway runoff and tire leachates on the basis of their quinone concentrations. That's the top panel here, um, Seattle site one, then number one and two, those are stormwater runoff and then TWP is the tire wear particle leachates. All right, and um, the median lethal concentration, which is a value we use to assess relative toxicity of different compounds, um, the median lethal concentration for these various waters was about 0.8 micrograms per liter of quinone. All right, now panel B is the dose response relationship for just the purified quinone. So the top one is on, based on the quinone concentration in those complex mixtures, the bottom one is just that quinone. And the LC50 is essentially the same, um, suggesting that the toxicity of the more complex mixtures of tire leachate or stormwater runoff could in fact be explained almost entirely by the concentration of the quinone present in those samples. So this allowed us to conclude that 6-PPD quinone is our primary causal toxicant. There may be other things present in that mixture which are contributing to the toxicity, but this is, this is, this is what we know now. We also showed that 6-PPD quinone is present above lethal concentrations in all roadway runoff samples that we analyzed. In uh, six out of seven Seattle area stream water samples um, where the water samples were taken around mortality events, did not necessarily mean we were catching the plume with the toxicant that caused mortality, but it was a good indicator. And that the concentrations were, um, so in these, in the Seattle area stream uh, samples, the concentrations of quinone were near or above that median lethal concentration. And then also that quinone was detected in runoff or receiving waters from a variety of West Coast locations. Um, and this encouraged us to conclude that we will expect to find quinone, this 6-PPD quinone, um, anywhere with tire rubber particles. And since our publication in December, January, December, officially January by the time it got um, you know, numbers in the journal. Um, since that time, there, there have been a lot of environmental monitoring studies coming out. Anyone who does this high resolution mass spec analysis has libraries of what they, what they cataloged already in water samples, right? So they could go back after our paper came out, they could go back through those libraries and, I, and show that, that in fact, yeah, they had detected that particular unknown chemical peak in their samples as well. So some of the publications coming out showing, yes, we're seeing it in, in um, snow melt, we're seeing it in air um, particle um, samples that have been taken. Um, there are some new studies being done, but some of this is, is that retrospective analysis. Okay, just a little bit more on the 6-PPD quinone and tires specifically. So ground level ozone, which is a ubiquitous air pollutant, is continually attacking the surface of tires. So that's why we have anti ozonants in tires. The way that they work is that they uh, are mixed into the tire tread rubber and they slowly migrate to the surface of the tire through the life of the tire. And so that the ozone reacts first with the anti ozonant rather than attacking the tire polymers. So without the anti ozonant, the surface of the tire cracks as ozone and other oxidants um, break the bonds between those tire polymers. So when the ozone reacts with 6-PPD, we now know it is transformed into 6-PPD quinone and some other transformation products. And that the, this, uh, this degradation of 6-PPD is, is what's responsible for that brown coloration on the surface of tires, all right? And you can see it sometimes more on the sidewall than on the tread because the tread's being continuously worn down. And, and the point that I wanna make here is that um, is that 6-PPD quinone is present in the surface of the tire so that uh, the quinone can leach directly from the surface of the tire. You don't necessarily have to have particles worn on the road somewhere or entering a stream in order to get that quinone into the receiving waters. Yeah. Okay, so what can we do about this? Uh, one solution is source control. Um, and so the US Tire Manufacturer Association we've been talking with 
um, about whether there are safer alternatives to 6-PPD. Uh, we've also been talking to groups like Salmon Safe and um, Amazon <laughs> about incentives and marketing opportunities for tires that, that would be Salmon Safe. Um, this solution is not likely to be very fast though, so what are, what are some of our other options? Other tools we have, you know, street sweeping. Um, I'd love for this to solve the problem. Um, it does not look based on current data on particle sizes, like, like street sweeping is very effective at capturing the size of particles that are worn off of tires. Um, but there's more work that needs to be done to better understand um, that problem. Um, there are also new technologies that might help. So there's this group called the Tire Collective, um, spelt in the European manner, because that's where they're located. And they recently won a James Dyson Award for this innovative concept of capturing tire particles at the point of generation using electrostatic. And then a more immediate solution that you know, I have been studying for, for several years now is green stormwater infrastructure. So these are technologies that encourage runoff to spread out, soak into soils instead of running directly into surface water. So things like permeable pavements and bioretention. And we study a variety of these, start in orange here at the Washington Stormwater Center. So green stormwater infrastructure can address both the water quantity and the water quality problem associated with runoff. Um, Bioretention is a, a cornerstone of many of these low tech approaches to stormwater treatment. And in Washington state, we have a, a simple bioretention mixture of sand and compost that has been recommended so far. So even prior to knowing what this chemical contaminant was in um, stormwater runoff that was causing our problems, we were studying bioretention to learn whether it, it could prevent the problem. So this is an example of a portable bioretention system that we built to test um, you know, whether uh, acute mortality of coho would still happen if, if um, roadway runoff was filtered through bioretention. Um, and let's see, so here we have, you know, we know what to expect in clean water. We know what to, what to expect in untreated runoff. This is what it looked like after we filtered it through bioretention. Would the fish be okay? And so despite not knowing what the responsible chemical was, we were able to show that in fact, um, this, this treatment approach was very effective. Um, here we go, some of the videos here. So uh, well water, um, unfiltered stormwater showing that that advanced loss of equilibrium phase. And now that same water, but passed through bioretention and the fish um, look absolutely fine. No mortality observed at all, no behavioral changes. All right, and we've also shown that this is true for stormwater treated through bioretention and exposed to juveniles and to ailbin. So um, Ed Kloje, uh, our my UW chemist collaborator has indicated that 6-PPD from um, the systems that we have worked on together, bioretention systems that we worked on together, that, that they were not able to detect 6-PPD quinone in the effluent from those experimental systems. Um, installing bioretention can be very expensive, uh, particularly in areas that are already developed. Um, some other systems that we have looked at are roadside treatments uh, in a study that we, that we did with WashDOT. So these are compost mended bioswales. And the idea here is to treat water as it flows laterally. Obviously, there's some infiltration that takes place as well. And uh, you know, again, doing that retrospective analysis, we were we were able to see that 6-PPD quinone was removed in that system about 90 percent um, to the night. You know, sometimes it was detected at very low levels, and sometimes it was not. All right, so where are we now? Um, we are asking a lot of questions, um, so are others. And we definitely have more questions than we have funds to support the research as we're trying to move forward. Um, you know, what other species are impacted by stormwater, whether those impacts are driven by 6-PPD quinone or not? Um, what about sublethal effects? Um, are there any chronic effects that happen from repeated exposures? And then, you know, would, would the chemicals driving that toxicity for other species and for some of these um, other types of endpoints uh, be different for different species, all right? And then in terms of treatment, how best to remove them. Um, 
and how much, you know, if we're talking about green storm or infrastructure, how much of that is needed. And so obviously now that we've identified 6 pb quinone in terms of the acute mortality of coho, we can start ask, we can start answering questions about how much is needed for that on the landscape. Some ongoing work that, that we have planned collaborating with um, Office of Research from EPA and uh, collaborating with ecology, you know, so these are all laboratory studies so far with 6 pb quinone and only with coho salmon. Uh, but one of the things that we're really needing to know is not just impacts in other species, but also impacts in real world situations. You know, what are the environmental conditions that, that might ameliorate or intensify that 6 pb quinone toxicity for coho? Uh, we're also starting to look at uh, alternative antiozonants and their transformation products because we would like to <laughs> avoid whoever's doing the research and a regret regrettable substitution where we just take 6 PPD and instead we're like, oh, well, let's just use 7 PPD. <laughs> it's not 6 PPD. All right, um, that is kind of, I'm kind of winding down here. How am I doing for time? Um, but we wanna make sure to leave time for questions. So I'm just gonna, a couple more things here, just sort of lessons I want people to think about. I want to bring together some of these concepts that I've brought up. So in the United States, we produce, you know, a lot of chemicals that are used commercially, right? And these are managed under the Toxic Substances Control Act. So more than 80,000 chemicals are listed there. All right. Uh, an additional more than 2,000 chemicals are registered for use as pesticides under the, under FIFRA. However, um, you know, and so, and we know that these chemicals get into environmental waters. We know that they form complex mixtures. And in fact, you know, you'd think, okay, but that's fine because we have regulations in place to protect aquatic life, right? We do have the Clean Water Act, which has done wonders for many things. Um, and in, in the Clean Water, Water, Clean Water Act is designed to prevent discharge of toxic pollutants in toxic amounts. And then that translates down to state level water quality criteria, which are supposed to protect, you know, fish and other uses. Um, so aquatic life criteria are concentrations of chemicals that are allowed in surface waters that are not supposed to harm aquatic species. However, <laughs> uh, in Washington state, we have aquatic life criteria for 31 chemicals. All right, and this is, you know, Washington state is not unique. Uh, most of these are metals and pesticides, you know, and there are some really bad actors that, that make this list of aquatic life criteria, but obviously it's very far from um, having criteria to protect against the thousands and thousands of chemicals that get into waters. Um, and then the permitting system that we have to prevent pollution from stormwater, specifically the NPDES permit system, is, is only really for a limited number of chemicals, which, you know, to date does not include 6 ppd quinone. That will take some time, right? All right, so the approach that we've been taking uh, for years now to let the aquatic animals tell us if there's a problem, you know, is something that we could talk about doing a little bit more of. You know, we could require toxicity testing using batteries of organisms, batteries being multiple um, species and or endpoints to look at the integrated toxicity, that the benefit of them is the integrated toxicity from these complex environmental samples instead of our regulations, which currently exist on a one by one by one basis. All right, so obviously we also need to develop additional aquatic life criteria. And, and, and certainly that's something that people are, are talking about doing for 6 ppd quinone um, and not just for coho, but you know, understanding whether we need to develop those for other species, other aquatic species as well. And, you know, and for and for humans. Um, oh, and then ultimately, it's not even as simple as that because I mentioned that the um, chemical complexity, you know, chemical toxicities can uh, and do often interact. So sometimes that interaction is just additive, but and sometimes it's antagonistic where it reduces um, toxicity. Um, but synergism can also take place where the presence of two creates a much stronger effect than just adding them together. So there is a growing understanding that mixtures are more often uh, the rule than the exception. And we're starting to recognize that regulations are needed to account for these, the fact that we have mixtures. All right, finally, finally, things I want you to go home thinking about um, are that tires are a really complex source of chemicals. Um, 
you know, not just the ones that I've talked about today that are relevant for coho salmon, but they're a really complex source of chemicals, you know, taking it back to that heat map, looking at the chemicals coming out of tires and then the chemicals in water samples, right? Um, we're gonna need both green infrastructure and source controls, I think, to address the problem of all of the chemicals that, that are getting into our waters. And I finally, um, one of the things that I talk about with my collaborator, Ed, is, is that to think more about chemicals that we put into products that are actually designed to be really reactive, right? They're designed to uh, interact with something like ozone in this case. And what hasn't been done enough is to ask what about the transformation products? Um, look at those and ensure that that's going to be safe for the environment. Uh, and if they're not, ask about safer alternatives. Okay, I'm going to stop there and leave some time for questions. My last ones are just like, you know, put green inspector in, drag list, da, 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 da. All right, I'm handing it back to whoever's in charge here. Uh, sure. Thank you. Wow, that was yeah. a really fascinating talk. Oh yeah. my goodness. Thank you so much. You want to go ahead, Cindy, and we can go sure. to the questions? There's yeah, plenty. We, <laughs> we got a lot of questions in the chat, so um, I kind of quickly jotted them down. So I'm just going to start with one of the first ones. And um, Emily, I think that you monitored these as well. So if I skip over one, please like jump in anytime. Um, so our first question was from Allison, and she asked uh, if, um, where did the coho that were used for the experiment come from? Okay, um, let's see. There have been a lot of experiments over the years. Um, so in my lab, I rear, I have juvenile coho that I acquire from, um, they're donated by uh, local tribes at, from their hatcheries. Um, the studies with adults, took place at the Suquamish Tribal Hatchery out in the Kitsap Peninsula. They were very generous in letting us come and use their space and use some of their fish, <laughs> um, which is really important. That's great. I think that you touched on this, but um, what purpose does the 6PPD serve in the tires makeup? So I think that you had said that it was um, to react against the ozone that's going to degrade the tire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, and it makes up like, up to 4%, I think, of the mass of the tire is this anti ozonant And there are other things in there, too, um, to protect against, uh, um, like, UV, you know, other types of oxidation. Um, but specifically for ozone, we have 6-PPD making up, a, you know, up, you know, somewhere between, like, 1% and 4% of the mass of the tire. And that it is designed to, con you know, continually rise to the surface and protect the tire throughout its life. And just to follow up, so is that ubiquitous, like amongst all tires, like for all vehicles? As far as we can tell, you know, they're, okay. they're not, um, the tire industry has, there's some data out there on, on general or generic tire recipes, but nobody, you know, publishes, <laughs> this is exactly what we put in our tires. Um, but it does look like 6PPD is ubiquitously used for um, ozone protection in tires of, across brands. I'm going to skip ahead to a question that's kind of related to that, and and that is, could the turf athletic fields that are filled with the crumb rubber be a significant contributor to the 6PPDQ in the streams as well? Yeah, so that's going to depend a lot on what their discharge system looks like. Um, we've been talking with King County about their athletic fields, and it looks like relatively few of those drain directly into surface waters. Um, most of them have some sort of infiltration um, uh, before the water then even just uh, passively enters um, surface streams without actually being pipe discharged, right? But in, in outside King County, other regions, you know, I'd certainly think it was possible you've got a lot of just direct runoff um, entering surface waters, in which case, yes, I would expect that there'd be um, there'd be 6PPD quinone in that runoff because, mm -hmm. you know, crumb rubber is essentially just ground up used tire treads for the most part, um, just like we used in our experiments. Yeah. Um, could tire wear uh, particles be an issue in, in rural high desert areas? All right. So, you know, as far as different regions so far, 
you know, until we get more environmental monitoring, monitoring data, we just don't know. Mm -hmm. um, we would certainly expect that, uh, you know, you're going to have variability across regions, depending on how much how much um, generation of tire particles there is in the environment, obviously a place with less cars um, um, and or less miles traveled overall, you know, will we'll generate less. And you're talking about a desert environment where it doesn't rain as much, right? And so less opportunity for the quinone to be leached, um, possibly more intense leaching every time it does rain. You know, I'm just, I'm just speculating. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. There was um, quite a few questions about the like persistence of 6-PPD quinone. Does it break down over time? Like, will the bioswale change the form of the contaminant to make it less toxic? Right. Um, so again, we don't we don't know the answer to that. We do know that that you know we expect that 6-PPD quinone acts like other similarly hydrophobic chemicals. It is somewhat hydrophobic, and that. You know, it gets removed by adsorption to um, the organic matter in bioretention systems. That, you know, that's that's the extent of of what we know about how that works. Um, you know, we do know from our sand filtration experiments that six PPD quinone that's already dissolved in water will just flow right through. Um, but it, you know, so if it's already dissolved off of a tire particle, you need something like organic matter present to adsorb the chemical. Um, if it is the actual tire particle, obviously you can have some physical filtration taking place with something just like sand. Whether there's transformation or when and how that transformation takes place is, you know, all stuff to come. Do you know of any commercial laboratories that are testing for 6-PPD quinone? I was just looking that up actually in response to a colleague's inquiry. I know that uh, Eurofins has been working at developing a method. Um, so far, their website says, ask us. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, so I don't know that they, you know, that they have it up and running for clients yet. Um, and I know that Ed's lab is, is trying to get to the point where they could take outside samples and run their analysis. And they're in the, the quagmire of getting certified by um, Washington Ecology. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm not aware process. right now of, of, you know, commercial labs that are offering that, but okay. you know, methods are being developed and should be soon if it isn't already. Somebody asked a question that I had just swaying back into more of the biology, anatomy, and physiology of the fish. The, is it really clear why coho are so sensitive compared to steelhead and chum, or is that still in the works? Yeah, right. At, at this point, still nothing. <laughs> okay. No, no reason um, why yet. We're hoping that with, you know, looking at this vascular integrity question, that we will be able to get to, you know, the actual target tissue, uh, and then and then from there be able to look at differences between species. Obviously, we could also be doing some sort of RNA sequencing um, type approach, and it's just a matter of, you know, time and money. So we don't have an answer yet. Oh, Cindy, you wanna? Yeah, so uh, it looks like Alan has commented in the chat that he's with Eurofins and ah. he says that they're up and running for testing. Ah, so exactly. yeah, reach out to him or uh, at, yeah, at the Sacramento lab. Okay, thank you. That's, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Alan, if you wanna put your contact information in the chat so people can reach out to you, that's that would be great. Oh, Chris Allen. Oh, ah. Chris Allen, I know Chris <laughs> Allen. <Okay. laughs> Sorry, Chris. Alan, comma K. <laughs> Um, there was another question about the bioretention experiments and if the media was ever tested without a compost amendment. And then if there's any concern about phosphorus within the compost amended media. Okay, let me let me see if I <clears throat> if I got that. So um, bioretention treatment without compost would just be sand, um, which we have you know, we did, we tested in our fractionation experiments and 6PP quinone just goes right through. Okay. Uh, and phosphor, you know, phosphor, I, I'm, I'm not, I've done some measurement of nutrients with the bioretention studies that I've done. I tend to have always done nutrient measurements, but it's not a focus of, of concern for me personally. Um, so there, you know, there's all sorts of people addressing the issue of phosphorus and, um, nitrates uh, leaching from compost in bioretention systems. And that, that, that certainly is a concern. I know that ecology has been working at developing an alternative media composition for more sensitive uh, receiving waters that might be receiving um, 
treated water from bioretention systems where they would be concerned about the nutrients that come out. Um, I will also add to that that I've uh, been doing studies kind of, of of the longevity of bioretention systems. And for that, we have been measuring nutrients as well um, in order to understand many things, including um, how long that, that nutrient pulsing is a concern. Um, it does abate over the first year or so. That's a great response. Um, circling kind of back on a higher level, um, like programmatic type questions, there was one about if federal highways have been engaged in sort of stormwater management discussions. I think you kind of touched on that in the action items. Uh, yeah, I didn't, didn't, didn't go into that, but um, Cindy Callahan is with Federal Highways. She, um, she's associated with WASHDOT, but she's with the Federal Highways. And uh, that's, that's who we were working on that bioswale project with. So they're certainly part of, um, part of the discussions that we have about, about being able to treat uh, and how we're gonna treat for, for 6-PPD quinone. You said that you had an order of magnitude more questions. <laughs> I can see it. Everybody has so many questions. There's a lot to know. There is. And there's a lot of curiosity. And um, yeah, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of energy behind this issue. You know, people are recognizing that, you know, it's serious and really wanting to, you know, do some good work to keep, be, keep these chemicals out of the streams. We want the salmon to come back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that video was heart wrenching. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, I guess last question that I have is just how can we stay on top of the science? Is there a suggested like resource that we should be plugged into or what's the best way to stay current on this topic? Um, the Washington Stormwater Center has, um, has a page um, about this. And so we are trying to keep that updated uh, with, with um, you know, research that comes out. So that's, I don't know if they're other better sources. <laughs> that's, that's what I oh, have. That's a good one. That's a great one. Thank you. Oh, um, there was actually one more question about bike tires. Cause I'm sure there's some bikers in the house. Um, right. yeah. Is also in those. Um, we don't know for sure until somebody actually, you know, tests bicycle tires, but bicycle tires will also need something, uh, to protect them against ozone. So I expect that six PPD is in there doing that for us. Um, and then as, as a result, um, 6-PPD quinone would also be generated by those tires. Um, you know, on the grand scale of things, I'm definitely not worried about bike tires as a, an important source of the chemical, even as a, even as a mountain biker. <laughs> um, it's, it's really, I think, the, the vehicle tires we need to be focused on. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And you're getting lots of kudos in the chat. So want to extend that to you verbally. Um, but that's all from us. Uh, if you have any more questions, I guess there's her email here and look forward to having everybody again soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.